So in the video today, we're going to look at the process by which liquids turn into gases. And we'll start off by uh, studying a little bit about evaporation. Then we'll look at evaporation in a closed container and how an equilibrium a situation is established. And then we'll look at the process of boiling. So to begin with, let's talk about evaporation. In a beaker or container of water, as you see here on the screen, we all know that before too long, if we leave this uncovered, the water level will gradually decrease until the entire beaker full has evaporated. So to understand what's taking place with this, we need to look at the energy of the individual molecules. So within this beaker, not every molecule, not every particle has the same amount of energy. And if we were to come up with a graph of energy distribution, versus the number of particles, number of particles here on the y-axis and the energy on the x-axis, we would see that there are a few particles of very low energy, a larger number of particles with intermediate amount of energy, and then finally that there are a few particles that are much higher in energy, and we would see a distribution curve looking something like this. Now to make this a little easier to understand, we'll color code the slow-moving low energy particles in blue the intermediate particles moving a little faster in yellow, and the very high energy fast moving particles in red. And so now if we look at a container of the water, we have a number of slow moving particles, a number of medium speed, high middle, middle energy particles, and a number of high energy particles in the red. But in order to break free of the bonds that hold the particles together, they have to have enough energy to be able to break away and escape. So let's say that only the red particles have enough energy to be able to evaporate. So in order for evaporation to occur, these high energy particles, these red particles, have to reach the surface where they're not surrounded and kept in by other water molecules and then have enough energy to be able to escape. Particles of high energy down here that aren't at the surface won't be able to escape. So because of the motion of the particles, gradually the high energy particles, when they reach the surface, escape and evaporation begins. And so what we have here is a, a reaction in which <clears throat> the liquid particles absorb energy and turn into a vapor. And that's the process of evaporation. Notice that this is an endothermic reaction as energy is a reactant. And so the result of this is that gradually the level of the water particles goes down and the energy content of this container, of the water that's left behind, also decreases. So evaporation, because it's the high energy particles that are being removed, is a cooling process. And this cooling um, aspect of evaporation uh, is shown when we perspire and the evaporation cools off our bodies, how our body temperature goes down. Of course, dogs use the same process as water evaporates off of their tongues and uh, their body cools down. Uh, happens when evaporation occurs within a closed container. So in this simulation, we'll start by adding a liquid to the container. And you can see that when the um, liquid is first put in the container, that there's a, a lot of the liquid particles that escape and uh, become the vapor particles. And as we just learned, those are the high energy particles. But now it's impossible for them to escape because the container is closed. We've got a closed system. And so if you track any individual particles, you will see that at times they will bounce off of the walls, exerting a pressure on the container, bounce off of each other in completely elastic collisions, and occasionally bounce back into the surface of the liquid and be uh, trapped back into the liquid phase. And of course, that process is called condensation. And if we leave the conditions the same, temperature, pressure, in a closed system, then we end up with a dynamic equilibrium. So at this point now, we have two opposing reactions um, which are going in opposite directions. We have the reaction of the... Uh, liquid evaporating in an endothermic reaction to turn into a vapor. 
And at the same time, we have the reverse reaction occurring where the vapor is turning back into a liquid and releasing energy. At the beginning, when we first uh, put the liquid in, since all of the particles were liquid, the rate of evaporation was fast. And of course, as more and more particles evaporated and less liquid was available, the rate of evaporation slowed down. On the other hand, the rate of condensation starts off very slow because there is no condensation taking place until the, the container fills up with the gas, but as the evaporation occurs, now more particles of the gas condense back into the liquid phase, and again if we leave the conditions the same, then we reach a dynamic equilibrium. So if we look back at our system at dynamic equilibrium, we can see that there are particles that exist um, as vapor and there are particles that exist as a liquid. And some particles are entering the liquid phase, of course that's condensation. Other particles are entering the vapor phase and that's evaporation. Now <clears throat> you can see that the particles that are evaporating are exerting a pressure on the walls of their container. Now if we change the intermolecular force, in other words if we have a liquid whose particles are held together tighter, you can see that we also will establish an equilibrium, but now there are fewer particles in the vapor phase and more particles in the liquid phase. Because of this, this liquid is exerting a, a smaller pressure than the particles uh, of the liquid whose bonds were weaker and more particles existed as a vapor. You can also see that the amount of pressure depends on the temperature, so if we heat this up, more particles evaporate, and again the pressure increases. So this characteristic pressure of a liquid that's at an equilibrium with its uh, vapor, the pressure exerted by the vapor in equilibrium with its liquid, is called the equilibrium vapor pressure. This concept of equilibrium vapor pressure has a lot to do with the con uh, what happens during boiling. So looking back now, if we have a closed container like this, um, shown on the left, where it's filled with a liquid with strong intermolecular forces, maybe something like water, which has hydrogen bonding, you can see that there are few particles existing as a vapor, many particles is existing as a liquid, and the pressure exerted by that vapor is uh, low. On the other hand, if we have a liquid with weak intermolecular forces, maybe acetone as an example, now the uh, fewer particles exist as a liquid, more particles exist in the vapor phase in equilibrium, and because of this it exerts a much higher pressure. Okay. So now let's look what takes place when in the process of boiling. So as a, a beaker full of water is heated from below, as shown here in, in the diagram, um, bubbles begin to form at first near the bottom where the vapor particles begin to separate out from the liquid particles. And let's look a little closer at what's taking place within that bubble. So as uh, water in the liquid phase is being heated, some of the particles get enough energy to turn into water in the vapor phase. So inside this bubble there are particles of water vapor. Now we all know that this is a closed system, this bump bubble here, and it acts just like a beaker with a lid on it. And so what we have is these particles in here are exerting pressure against the walls of the bubble. Now, also exerting pressure on the bubble is atmospheric pressure, which is applied at the surface of the water by the air, by the atmosphere surrounding. And that acts within the water to kind of oppose the equilibrium vapor pressure that's uh, from the inside of the bubble. So there's atmospheric pressure pushing in on the bubble, equilibrium vapor pressure pushing out on the bubble, and uh, as that bubble rises towards the surface into the cooler water, then at first the bubbles collapse and don't make it to the surface. But when this equilibrium vapor pressure becomes equal or greater than the atmospheric pressure, that's when boiling occurs. So now let's look at this graph which uh, shows the comparison between vapor pressure uh, measured in tors on the y-axis versus temperature measured in degrees C on the x-axis. And we have a number of different liquids here, uh, diethyl ether, ethyl alcohol, water, and ethylene glycol. And let's focus at first on water. Like you would expect, again this is equilibrium vapor pressure, as the water is heated up, 
and more of the water exists in the gas phase than it does in the liquid phase as the temperature rises, the vapor pressure that that water exerts rises rapidly. So for example, at 80 degrees C, the equilibrium vapor pressure of water looks like it's approximately 300 millimeters of mercury or tor, which are the same thing. <clears throat> okay, remember the concept that boiling occurs when the vapor pressure of the liquid is equal to the atmospheric pressure on the outside. Now at sea level, standard atmospheric pressure has a value of 760 millimeters of mercury right on this line. And so you can see that the temperature at which the vapor pressure of water equals the atmospheric pressure at, at sea level, 760 millimeters, that's 100 degrees right here. And of course, that's the normal boiling temperature of water. So one thing we can get from this graph is that if the pressure of the atmosphere is significantly different than 760, for example, if you're camping at a high altitude where the air is thinner, the pressure may drop down slightly, maybe 740 or 730 millimeters of mercury or even less, and you can see that the pressure uh, of the water now will equal that atmospheric pressure. Let's say this is our pressure right about here. You can see that now the temperature at which water will boil has dropped down from 100 significantly lower. And so consequently the boiling temperature of water is lower at high altitudes than it is at sea level. Now if we compare some other liquids to water, ethanol, ethyl alcohol, has weaker intermolecular forces than water does, so it evaporates more rapidly. It exerts more pressure at lower temperatures than water does. So for example, uh, the vapor pressure of alcohol at 78.3 degrees C is equal to standard atmospheric pressure. So the boiling point of alcohol is 78.3 degrees C when the outside pressure is 760 millimeters mercury. Diethyl ether, with even weaker forces holding the particles together, evaporates more rapidly and boils at a much cooler temperature, 34.6 degrees. Again, boiling takes place when the vapor pressure of the particular liquid is equal to the atmospheric pressure outside. And so, again, at standard atmospheric pressure, 760 millimeters at sea level, then these temperatures here are the boiling points of those liquids. Now, ethylene glycol has a much higher uh, excuse me, much stronger intermolecular bonds and much uh, lower um, equilibrium vapor pressure. So you can see even at 100 degrees, it's not even beginning to get close to uh, the pressure that's required for in order for it to boil. Okay, so what we've learned about today have been three things. There's been evaporation, evaporation equilibrium, the condensation evaporation equilibrium, and then finally uh, what takes place during the process of boiling.